Welcome to The Woman's Connection. I'm Barry Louise Switzen, your moderator. The Woman's Connection is a program about events shaping women's lives and helping one gain authentic power on a personal or a professional level. So won't you stay tuned? Known fact, women have been underpaid through the centuries. And with me are two women who wrote a book, Women Don't Ask. And we're going to find out why women don't ask to get paid what they're worth. And I would like to welcome Zara Lashiver and Linda Babcock. Hi, it's a pleasure Hi. to be here. Nice having both of you. Nice to be here. Would you tell us a little bit about your background first before we get into the book? Sure. Um, I'm a writer. I live in the Boston area. I've had a long-term interest in women's life and career obstacles. And I've uh, written for the New York Times, New York Review of Books, Vogue, Glamour, you know, some serious publications and some um, really women-focused publications. And I'm Linda Babcock, and I'm a professor at Carnegie Mellon at the Heinz School of Public Policy and Management. And I teach negotiations, and I've been there for about 15 years, and I have a PhD in economics. What findings did you find? Well, I think Linda should start with that. Yeah, um, we found that men are more likely to initiate negotiations, so to start a negotiation to ask for what they want between two and nine times as much as women. And we did a variety of kinds of studies in different settings, and the result was the same. Men are just more likely to ask for what they want. All right. Why do men ask for what they want and women don't? Well, there are a couple of reasons. Um, one is that kids are socialized from a very young age differently. Boys and girls are taught different lessons. So girls are taught to focus on the needs of others, and boys are really taught to pursue their self-interest. And so they learn these lessons from very young. And so as adults, women don't really think of their own needs first. Well, I'm very surprised considering the 70s was the liber liberation factor for women in getting ahead. Are we still that far behind? In We're a lot asking? further behind than people think. I interviewed almost 100 people for this book. And in that group, there were women who ranged in age from 22 to 72. And all the women in their 20s said the same thing to me. They said, this isn't our problem. This is a boomer problem. This is your generation's problem. But Linda's research shows that that's not the case, actually. I did a study of students graduating with master's degrees from Carnegie Mellon. And what I found is I looked at people who negotiated their job offer. And I found that only 7% of the women students negotiated their offer, but 57%, or eight times as many of the male students, negotiated their offer. And these are people in their 20s. And so women in that, in, in that age group are not asking as much as, as men, just like women of older generations. I also did some studies that used students in, their, in college. So they were late teens and early 20s. And those women were much less likely to initiate negotiation also. Is there any specific reason besides the fact that we are taught to nurture? I mean, even if the 20-year-olds are still doing it, what makes it so that they don't get it? Well, there's, a, there's another factor, which is the treatment we tolerate and accept from adults. And in fact, it's been shown by many studies that we, that we as a society don't like women who are too aggressive. Women don't like other women who are too aggressive, and men don't like women who are too aggressive. And so as a result, women watch other women who come on too strong say, hey, pay attention to me. I've done some good work. I should be rewarded for it. I want to raise. And they get rebuffed for that. And so the, the combination of being sort of conditioned, socialized to be more modest, not to toot your own her own, to focus more on what other people need, and worrying that if they do ask for something, they may, in fact, get a negative response and not get what they want, makes women feel a lot of anxiety about negotiating. Then how do we overcome this problem? Well, there are several things that we recommend. Um, the first one, which seems to be the most effective, is just to say to women, think of the world as a more negotiable place. M women, far more than men, seem to think that they need to accept the status quo and that they're kind of stuck with their circumstances and have to make the best of them. And men are much more likely to say, well, thanks, that's great, but I'd really like a little more, you know, I'd like an extra week of vacation, or I need more money, and, you know, I need an assistant. And women are, you know, more likely to work hard and wait for someone to say, hey, you need an assistant. You're working too hard. Um, so when we say this to women, when we say just assume that you can ask for almost anything, we get this response. It's sort of like a light bulb going on. They say, I understand my behavior so much better now. Or they'll go out and they'll come back and they'll say, you won't believe this. I asked for all these things and I got them. Or I got three quarters of them. And of course, you know, you, they wouldn't have gotten any of them if they hadn't asked. And so 
that's one thing. I mean, there are, you know, another thing that... Um, let me give you an example, yeah. actually. Uh, I had a PhD student of mine, his name is Josh, and he came into my office one day and he said, hey, my mom really wants to thank you. And I thought it was weird because I'd never met his mom before. <laughs> and so he told me what happened. He'd been on the phone with her and she'd been explaining a situation at work. And she was working part-time at an internet startup and she took some ideas to her boss about new things the company could pursue. And he said, that's great. Why don't you get, re get started on this right away? And she was really kind of worried because she couldn't do what she was supposed to be doing and pursue these new ideas. So she said to her son, I'd really like to start working full time. And he said, well, why don't you just ask your boss if you can increase your hours? And she said, oh, I can't do that. And so he said, look, I have this advisor, and I, let me tell you about her research. <laughs> and women can just ask. That she finds women don't ask. You can just go ahead and do it. And she did. And she walked into her boss's boss's office, explain the situation. He said, that's so great. I'm glad you asked. Of course, I'd like you to work full time. And so women, once they start thinking about the world as a more negotiable place, I think, can really realize the benefits from asking. Yes. Something else that women can do, and I was talking about anxiety, is they can really prepare for their negotiations, do research, f find out from you know the internet, from trade publications, from talking to their social networks, by, from talking to men who do the same jobs they do, as well as women, what their market value is, what their worth is, and then role play with a friend or a colleague so they can anticipate roadblocks or, you know, plan for how they're going to respond if they don't get the answer they want. And this has been shown to give women a much greater sense of control over the process and to produce better outcomes. The bottom line is women in the long run will actually earn less because they don't ask and don't negotiate. Absolutely. Yeah, there's obviously many things responsible for the wage gap. Men, women on average earn about 76 percent of what men do and there's lots of things responsible for that. Outright discrimination, di men and women in different jobs, but we believe that one thing that's been overlooked is women's reluctance to negotiate for things like salary, for things like more responsibility on a project that will give them experience to move up the corporate ladder. So we think it's a, a piece that's been overlooked in trying to understand the wage gap. Now, years ago, I met a woman who said she found the playing field even mm -hmm. with the internet when she was coming up with a mm -hmm. um, when she was coming up with a game. She said she could talk on equal terms mm -hmm. with the men, mm -hmm. and there was no difference in how she was perceived. What's interesting is that, is that there are a few studies out now that show that the internet has levelized the differences between what people pay for cars. Because you're shopping for cars online now, people don't know if you're a man and a woman, that men and women are getting similar prices for cars when they use the internet, and there's still a differential when they bargain face to face. So that's very interesting. There's a fascinating study that someone did um, in which um, they compared people who auditioned for symphony orchestras in which it was visible whether it was a man or a woman who was auditioning and when they were blind auditions whoever was auditioning was behind a screen and women got jobs like 25 percent more when they were behind the screen and they couldn't tell whether they were men or women so you know the listeners th what they heard was distorted simply by the fact that they saw a woman playing so there's still this prejudice of a woman mm -hmm. and a man and even I think people with you know good intentions there are people who are convinced they're not prejudiced about men and women but we all have these prejudices that affect us subconsciously one of the things you wrote about in the book was women don't set goals and priorities. Mm -hmm. How does this affect them going oh, up the ladder? It, it's, it's huge because the biggest factor determining how well you're going to do a negotiation is what you walk in the door with. That is, what goal you have going into the negotiation. And in the studies that I conducted with Hannah Riley at the Kennedy School, we found that women set much lower goals going into a negotiation, and this led to them getting much worse outcomes. So how can a woman prepare? There are lots of things that she can do. She should use industry sources, magazines, publications that talk about salary. She can go on the internet and there's a variety of websites like salary.com or jobstar.org that have salary information. You can type in your occupation, how many years of experience you have, where you live, and it'll give you a range of what people with your experience and background make and arm yourself with that information. You can also talk to your, your colleagues, find out what they make, also ask men, because they get paid more. <laughs> but are men going to really tell you what they make? 
I always ask people what they make, <laughs> and people, people, you know, you give them a way out. Say, I, I know this is uncomfortable. If you don't, if you don't want to share it, don't even worry about it. But I'm just curious. I'm trying to do some benchmarking. What would I expect for a salary for someone like me? So they don't necessarily have to reveal what they earn, but they can tell you what what they think you should be earning, and that'll give you some information because women may not know that they're being underpaid, and so they really need to arm themselves with that information going into the negotiation, setting a very high target and sticking to it during the negotiation. And that's why um, the role playing that Sara talked about can be really helpful because women often at the first sign of resistance may concede. And if they role play, they can practice a little bit saying, well, okay, so you can't meet my offer. How close can you come? They have a comeback to just conceding. So they don't give up and they still progress. Exactly. Right. Women because tend to concede more rapidly than men at, you know, at any sign of resistance. Say, okay, never mind, I'll take the lower figure. And what Linda has taught me and teaches her negotiation students is you should plan to go four rounds. That the person who, you know, you're negotiating with is going to expect you to ask for more than you're willing to accept. So you need to ask for more than your target so you have room to back down to what you want. You also have to figure out what your bottom line is below which you will not except what your like walk out the door number is and having those th both of those things women tend to ha sort of know what the bottom line is i really can't do this for less than you know $22,000 and, so and that's then what they get then that's if what they, they get, focus they get the on bottom line. the minimum that but they, they do they much need. better if they focus on a high target how can women ask for something without being aggressive well, this is a very important um, issue, and it's, it's complicated because, as I said, we don't like aggressive women in our culture, and um, if you come on too strong asking for what you want, you might not get it just because someone doesn't like your manner. And so studies have shown that if women use what they call a social style, acting more friendly, smiling, making friendly eye contact, using inclusive hand gestures, and not being threatening, that they're much more likely to get what they want, and it allows them to remain tough on the issues, tough on their targets, while being a little bit softer on the relationship. Um, I could give you an example. Say a woman you know, likes her job, feels she's underpaid, gets an offer for $10,000 more. She could go into her boss and say, you need to meet this offer. I'm out of here. That's aggressive. And he might find that antagonizing. It's, it's, it's competitive. It's yeah. a competitive approach. And so um, he might say, OK, go. But if she goes in and she says, you know, I really like working for you, and I like this company, I like my job, but I've been offered, you know, this much money, and I really have to consider it because it's a lot of money. But if there's any way that you can match it so I can stay, I'd really love to keep working for you. And she's likely to have a better outcome if she does that, but she hasn't conceded anything. If he doesn't match it, she can still walk out the door and take the higher paying job. And we think it's unfair that women kind of have to walk this tightrope between being assertive, asking for what they want, but not being too aggressive. But we're just trying to be pragmatic about the expectations that society has for how women should be. And so um, they have to kind of play this very delicate balancing act. Too bad we just can't change everything right away. Yes. Well, they? we're trying to. <laughs> but yes, we, we can't really change the world today. But we're hoping that our book will start the dialogue that helps with this change, that we can be more acceptive as, of a society of women who ask. When is it appropriate for a woman to ask or not ask for something? Well, I think, I think it's, it's, it's hard for women to know what to ask if they don't have the information about what's, what's appropriate because they may feel like they're already paid enough or that they, they don't deserve any more. And so that's where the research comes in in terms of knowing if you are underpaying, know, knowing what's, uh, what's out there and available for, for the asking. So just doing some research, gathering some information, you will know what's, what's appropriate. But there's also many other things that women can ask for in their working lives. They can ask for, you know, titles, title raises, or they can ask for, you know, the opportunity to work on projects that interest them. And in general, our advice is just assume that there's no harm in asking. You know, as long as you don't ask in a threatening, you know, antagonistic way, there's no harm in asking, and you'll find out whether whatever it is is available or not. But if you never ask, you'll never know. Many women can ask for somebody else better than they can yes, ask for themselves. Yes, that's a very good point. Yeah, that's another piece that we found in the research, is that women are terrific negotiators on behalf of others. It's really for themselves that they're more reluctant and hesitant. So women are terrific negotiators for their spouses and for their kids and for their friends. 
also for their employers, for their bosses, for their clients, for their customers, terrific negotiators. But it's, it gets back to this issue of socialization, that they're supposed to be modest and not want things for themselves, focus on the needs of others. So women have more trouble asking for things for themselves. So how do you overcome this? Well, we wrote a book, <laughs> and we're trying to, to tell women that it's, that it's okay to, to want what you want and to ask for it, and we're hoping that society will become increasingly tolerant of women that do this. Yes, we hope the book will not just be read as a woman's book, but as a book about how our society can change to make all of us more accepting of women asking for what they want. And, you know, the business piece is really critical. Our economy is lagging. Um, everybody, every businessman, every businesswoman wants to find ways to maximize productivity and, and you know, increase growth. And if they're not, if they're underusing half their workforce, they're not doing that. And so we're hoping that, you know, this will reach uh, the business world. And in fact, we've gotten a lot of coverage from the business press. Um, and that some of, you know, money's a great motivator. We're hoping that that will actually sort of jumpstart some change. And as Deloitte and Touche was able to achieve cultural change among, in a huge company, 95,000 people, we think that cultural change with, you know, individual people in lots of different places making small changes can actually bring about big changes. The big snowball effect. Yeah, yeah. or the hoping. tipping point. And that parents, sort of too. You know, Sara told this story about, about her son. And we're hoping that parents re-examine the things, that, the behavior that they model for their kids also, and so that we can change future ge generations growing up. What can businesses do to help women? Well, one thing is they have to notice the differential rates at which women and men ask for things that they want and try to adjust their decision making accordingly. Let me tell you how this came about in my organization. I used to be the director of the PhD program at the Heinz School. And one day I had a group of very angry and upset female graduate students in my office. And they wanted to know why the male students were all teaching their own courses and the female students were teaching assistants. And I didn't think that that sounded fair. And so I went to talk to the associate dean who handled teaching. And he said, the men just come and ask me if they can teach a course. And the women just don't ask. And so a big lesson. A big lesson. And what it led to was this disparity in the opportunities that the students had. And I noticed this over other things, that men would come in to ask for additional resources for a project they were working on or printing business cards, and the women wouldn't ask. And so here I was, as a manager of these students, presiding over this really inequitable distribution of resources and opportunities, and which was quite unfair. So once I really noticed what was going on, I was able to adjust the way that things were done in my program so that there wouldn't be this disparity. Because what it led to is the men teaching the women not. Maybe the women were better teachers, so I wasn't utilizing them as in, as instructors efficiently if I was just if they were just giving out the opportunities to the men so people in positions of power need to realize that women aren't asking and adjust their decisions if they want things to be more equitable in their organization and they don't want to underutilize their women would this also have to do with men being chauvinistic I think that you said you know are the bosses of these uh, 20 somethings in their 50s I actually think that younger men are less chauvinistic than probably the, the guys at the tops of most organizations. Um, I mentioned this project where I um, interviewed a lot of scientists to find out um, what the glass ceiling problem was. And I interviewed a lot of male scientists who really, you know, were married to female scientists, wanted their wives to have the same opportunities they had, and also themselves wanted to be freer to spend time with their children and be active parents. And in science, the culture is often, you work 90 hours a week, you're at the lab all night long, and that is obviously difficult for women with children, but I found that there are a lot of men who didn't want to live that way either. So I think younger men, younger managers are going to be more receptive to this notion. And um, we gave a, a talk last week to a mixed group, and I wouldn't say they were especially young men. They were men probably, you know, in their 30s and 40s, a lot of heads nodding around the room. And there was one man who said afterwards, there's a massive underuse of talent in this country. So I think younger men who have entered the workforce at the time when a lot of women were entering the workforce, have observed that women are really talented and you know smart and can do many, many terrific things that they don't always get to do. So That's I don't think reasons. chauvinism is as big a problem as it used to be. But one of the things that businesses can do in addition just paying attention to this is mentoring women, is teaching them how to ask if they haven't learned it growing up. And you know, going 
and talking to them about, look, you need to stand up for yourself in the organization. You need to ask for things that you want that are going to help you move up the, the ladder. And, and so people need to be taught, women need to be taught. And so ma managers, men and women, can take this on and really help the people under, the, under them fully utilize their potential. It sounds like when your students came in to you and complained, I think it was a learning lesson for them as well as you. It was totally a learning lesson. We, we figured it out together that this was going on, and that's what really started me on the research because there was, at, at that time, there was no research that looked at this question. All the research looks about at what happens during a negotiation, what are the strategies that people use. No research had looked at when people see something as negotiable and what motivates them to initiate a negotiation. How do you think low self-esteem plays a part in this? Well, um, we talk about this in the book, and it's, it's not exact, we don't exactly call it low self-esteem, but uh, a, a low sense of entitlement, of self-entitlement, that women are not um, raised to think of their work in terms of its monetary value because women's work traditionally hasn't been paid. You know, the hardest job in the world, raising children, healthy, productive citizens, was considered not working. So, um, you know, women do have a depressed sense of entitlement that keeps them from recognizing what the market value of their skills is. So this is again where the research can you know come in talking to your your social networks talking to men who are doing the same sort of work and um, just feeling entitled to you know ask questions, find out um, that that can help. It can really astonish women. Uh, Linda has a story about a woman who had worked, I guess part time for you know almost thirty years as I think she was a rehabilitation counselor in a hospital, and finally they offered her a full time job, and she been, was very poorly paid. She was making like sixteen dollars an hour, and she didn't know if she should just be grateful to have a permanent job, or maybe she should ask for more money. And so her friends said, "Go talk to Linda." <laughs> and Linda said, "Let's do some research together." And they found out that the you know the average wage for someone with her experience in that region, you know in that specialty was between twenty and twenty five dollars an hour so she asked for twenty three which was right in the middle and she got it which was an increase of what forty forty five something like forty one percent over yeah. what she'd been making before it sounds like she should have gotten it retroactive <laughs> yes it does yes it does That's unfortunately right. women sacrifice an enormous amount that they can never get back if they don't negotiate from the very beginning of their careers and I guess the other issue that's related to self-esteem is one of self-efficacy. Women don't believe they're good negotiators, and so they get anxious about going into a negotiation, and then, as we said, at the first sign of resistance, they concede. And that's where some of the role-playing really helps women to feel a lot more comfortable with the negotiation process. And I guess we should also add that you know, women are not bad negotiators. We talked about how they negotiate really well on behalf of others, so they have the skills. Women also take a more collaborative approach to negotiation, where men are more likely to take a, a competitive approach. And you might think that people that take a very competitive approach are going to do better, but the last 20 years of negotiation research has really shown people actually do better when they take a collaborative approach to negotiation. So women are actually terrific negotiators. So it's, a, it's basically a win-win situation. It's so everybody absolutely. wins. That's right. And I think women believe this because the men's way of doing things is taken as the default and the right way that you should right. do things. It's just, it's just the way our society, what, what the default is. And so women, because they have a different style, are often, they're often judged as being defective or not as good when their approach, though different, may actually in fact be superior. What would you like to leave the audience with? I guess just get out there and ask. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'll tell one story if we have time, which is a woman I interviewed who was an electrical engineer, and she'd gotten, a, she'd gotten a good degree, done very well in college, and yet when she went out to get a job, she said she felt like a fraud, like, why would anyone hire me as an electrical engineer? But she immediately got a good offer, and when uh, the personnel manager asked her what she wanted by way of a salary, she said, I don't care what you give me as long as you give me a job. Ooh. And she said a big smile wreathed across his face, and she later found out that he gave her the absolute bottom of the range for her position. And it took her 10 years to, to get up to where she should be, and she was only able to actually get paid her, the, her worth for the value of her work by leaving that company and going somewhere else. And she was never able to regain the lost wages from those 10 years when she was underpaid. So start early, ask often. And I mean, I would say, don't think of it so much as negotiation, because the word negotiation is intimidating for a lot of women. Just think of it as asking. 
ask more. Assume more things can be asked for, that everything isn't, you know, something you have to make the best of. Well, Sarah, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank and you. And Linda, you too. Thank it's you very much. It's been terrific learning all about how to negotiate. I hope you've learned something about asking for what you are worth.